Thank you for having me, and thank you for, um, for coming tonight. Uh, is anyone having trouble hearing me? I do have another microphone that I can use if you're having trouble. OK, I'll, I'll speak loudly, but let me know. Raise your hand if you have trouble hearing me. Um, also, please um, stop me anytime with questions. I'm happy to answer questions as I'm going through the talk tonight. OK, so um, I already uh, uh, I got this nice introduction of, um, that covered some of my background, but I did want to introduce myself a little bit and let you um, uh, know that I, my background is in biochemistry from um, University of Iowa, and then I studied medicinal chemistry, which is going to be a main focus of the talk tonight. Um, I, uh, in studying medicinal chemistry, it's a background of pharmacy, um, pharmacology, chemistry, and biochemistry, kind of woven into um, the science of drug design. And um, I currently teach about uh, medicinal chemistry and protein biochemistry. And so I'm going to be talking about other people's research tonight and, um, and introducing the, the um, chemistry and biochemistry of drug design. I, um, in putting my talk together tonight, I tried to go to the next slide with the, the outline for the talk. I was um, bringing together topics that I was interested in learning about that, was, um, that I was most excited about hearing when I was in um, school and what I enjoy teaching to students that is, uh, helps me even just a, as a person who gets sick sometimes and takes medicine. It's interesting to, for me to understand the molecular basis of what's happening. And so that's really what the focus of, of tonight's talk is. So I'm going to um, start by giving a historical um, uh, look at the story of aspirin and one of the, the first drugs that was discovered that's still on the market today. And then I'm going to give some background into uh, protein biochemistry so that we can study what's happening at the molecular level of um, understanding the mechanism of drug action. And I'm going to talk, um, introduce the um, discipline of medicinal chemistry and talking about um, the development of Celebrex and Crixivian. And um, then I'm going to wrap up talking about some, um, some current research and um, databases that you can go to that are really um, great public sources for learning more about and looking up any drugs that, or medicines that you may be interested in learning more about the molecular mechanisms. Okay, so to, um, to start out, um, willow bark uh, is, our, is the beginning of our story of aspirin. It has been used for pain relief since antiquity. It was originally, um, or it was, has been described by Hippocrates as a pain reliever. Um, but it um, is thought to have been used even before um, Hippocrates. And people would chew on the bark of willow, of the willow uh, bark for pain relief. Um, in the um, 1800s, the natural product from willow bark was isolated and was found to be um, the silicin molecule that um, I show here. And this molecule um, has a, a sugar component, which is this ring here. And then um, a benzene ring and these um, two hydroxyl groups end up, uh, if you kind of cut off the sugar portion, that's um, salicylic acid, which was found to be the active component in willow bark. So in the 1800s, chemists started purifying natural products um, from their sources and characterizing their chemical structure and then um, synthesizing the natural products. So uh, with... Uh, um, Salicylic acid, it was purified successfully in 1828 by um, Buchner. And then um, the structure was solved um, in 1860. And, um, and the um, chemistry for understanding how to synthesize salicylic acid in large quantities um, was discovered so um, that salicylic acid could be made in large amounts and didn't have to be purified from the natural source. And then it started being sold. Um, for pain relief, but it had this um, side effect of really upsetting people's stomachs. So salicylic acid worked for the pain relief, but it was, um, but the, the side effects were so harsh that um, nobody really wanted to take it. Um, then at the Bayer Corporation, um, Felix Hoffman was the chemist working for Bayer, and he um, added this acetyl group to um, salicylic acid to synthesize acetosalicylic acid, which is another name for aspirin. So um, this acetyl group is this two-carbon group that's added onto um, the hydroxyl group of salicylic acid. And this, pro this chemical process was being used, um, it seems, um, 
uh, almost a, a random process, but it was a, um, a chemical reaction that had recently been characterized, and they thought it might help so, with some of the side effects of, of, of other drugs also. So um, aspirin wasn't, or salicylic acid wasn't the only molecule that was being modified in this way at this time. Um, they also did this um, same reaction with morphine. Yes? What, what was the, the side effect, and, and why, why were they then, how did this um, compound help with the side effect? Okay, so the, the side effect that I was talking about was mainly being harsh on the stomach. So that was the main side effect that um, they had, that they were trying to, to alleviate. And they didn't know whether this was going to work or not. It was kind of a, a, um, a, a just a trial and error kind of thing. They were trying to modify the molecule and hope that it could still have the, act, the um, pain relieving benefits, but help with this, the stomach issue. Um, but they didn't know if this would work. Um, so they were also using the same method at this time to modify morphine to make it less addictive. And they acetylated uh, morphine and um, synthesized heroin during the same time, um, which obviously wasn't successful, made it more, more addictive. Um, but the aspirin um, was, was very successful. So it was um, uh, interesting how, how much trial and error goes um, into drug design. Do they, do they use acid chloride for, for the reaction? Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. Sorry, I'm not sure what the, what the reaction, uh, what all of the conditions were. Yes? Uh, we're going to be getting into the molecular um, uh, mechanism, but at this time they still didn't know. So they and they didn't know if this this would work um, to make it less. But we are going to talk about the molecular interactions and how it, um, how the side effect was alleviated. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so when when this was um, first synthesized, they um, before they even started the animal or clinical trials. Um, the head of um, the Bayer Labs, Heinrich Dresser, took the drug himself and found that it still relieved pain and wasn't harsh on his stomach. So he um, was um, started to market this drug and um, and started to look into getting a patent for the drug. Um, and he was unsuccessful in Germany because uh, Germ somebody had already done this chemical reaction and characterized it in the literature. They just weren't marketing it for pain relief. So Bayer moved um, the corporation to um, the U.S. And because they were able to get a patent for um, aspirin in the U.S. So um, they moved, um, they started making aspirin and marketing it here. And Eichen Grun um, was um, the, in, at Bayer named the compound aspirin. The A is for that acetyl group that I mentioned. And then the spirin is for another plant that also has the same um, molecule, uh, the spirea plant. So um, willow bark wasn't the only place that they could find this, this, uh, this natural product. They also found it in spirea, and so that um, gave the name aspirin. Okay, so it has been marketed in the U.S. since 1899, um, but we um, weren't able to answer this question until many years later, how aspirin works. And I think it's interesting to think about how long the, um, this product was on the market before we really knew the molecular mechanism. Um, we started to get an idea of it in the 1970s. So there's a, a big gap in here where it was being used and nobody knew exactly uh, what it was doing. Okay, so to be able to answer that question, I'm going to um, give another um, little um, uh, overview of history of what was um, happening in biochemistry in the 50s and 60s and protein structure. Um, to bring us up to uh, being able to talk about aspirin again. Um, so in the 50s, um, in the early 50s, uh, uh, there were a couple labs that were competing um, heavily into trying to determine the structure of DNA and proteins. There was um, Linus Pauling at Caltech who was um, at competing with um, the Cavendish Laboratory in London. And um, Linus Pauling, I don't have, have him up here, but um, he uh, defined um, resonance chemical resonance structure and had um, theories for the structure of 
proteins, um, the alpha helix and proteins and DNA. And it was his um, bonding, chemical bonding theory that was really um, instrumental to being able to solve these problems. But then at the Cavendish Laboratory, they um, were more advanced in their X-ray crystallography measurements, which ended up being the data that really led to being able to solve these structures. So in 1953, um, the double helix for DNA was determined um, by Watson and Crick, which I'm sure many of you um, know about this paper, um, using the X-ray crystallography measurements from um, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. And then in um, 1960, um, also using X-ray crystallography, the first protein structure was determined. And I'm going to give a brief overview of X-ray crystallography in the next couple slides so we can understand um, the, the, a little bit about the experiments that lead to protein structures. Um, and then this uh, model here is uh, one of the first uh, protein models that was made. And the experiment uh, for X-ray crystallography um, uses electron density maps of the molecule. And this is um, a handmade, uh, a, a hand-drawn picture of a model that was handmade of the protein um, using that electron density map. So this uh, molecule is a, a hemoglobin, which is actually a tetramer, so four different proteins all together. Um, but this was the resolution that they had at the time to make this model of the, of the protein structure. Sorry, I keep flipping forward. Um, at this, uh, around the same time in 1961, um, the genetic code was also determined, um, which allowed um, scientists to understand more about how um, the, uh, uh, the, the chemical information in a cell was um, translated. So putting this all together, we had, um, there was a big revolution in biology where which we now could now, um, or they could then understand um, that DNA structure was an exact structure. And uh, they knew it was composed of nucleic acids, but they now knew that the order of the, of the nucleic acids were, um, were the, the, the instructions for the cell. Um, protein, they knew it had been composed of amino acids, but now they understood that it was also the, uh, the order of amino acids that were essential for determining that protein's function. And with the solving of the first crystal structure for proteins, they also understood that three-dimensional structure was essential to the protein function. So in the central dogma of biology, um, the genetic code allowed us to understand how uh, the sequence of the DNA was used to um, make a messenger molecule of RNA, which is also a nucleic acid. And that, that um, message then uh, was translated into protein, which, um, which is uh, really the workhorse of the cell. So there, as many, um, um, so there are many different types of proteins in our cells that work together in assembly lines to make molecules. Um, some proteins are in the cell membrane and pass messages in and out of the cell. And they are um, the, the workhorses and really um, do the, the work of the cell. Um, at, at the end of, um, of all of, of the, the 60s, we really understood that the, the structure of the protein was essential for, for what the protein did, and the structure was determined by the sequence. Um, but we didn't know how to go from the sequence to the structure, um, and that, that's still a current problem. Okay, so I need to spend a little bit of time going through um, protein structure so that we can, we can dive in and look at how, how drugs interact with proteins. So um, I did talk about um, pro proteins being uh, composed of amino acids. So they're a polymer, um, just like um, DNA is a polymer of nucleic acids, proteins are a polymer of amino acids. And the amino acids, um, there's 20 different types and they're all abbreviated with this one letter code and they're linked together in a long chain. So this is called the primary structure of proteins. And um, since uh, the uh, genomic revolution, and we have the, in 2001, we solved the, the um, sequence of the human genome. So we have, um, since we have the sequence of the human genome, we have all of the amino acid sequences of the human proteins. But what we still don't have are, is um, understanding how these proteins fold into their three-dimensional structure. 
which we found, which we realize is essential to understanding how they're functioning. So we still don't have all of the three-dimensional structures of human proteins, even though we do have this um, primary structure. So uh, the primary structure folds into a very specific tertiary structure. Um, and here in the middle, I'm showing you a couple of ways of that we represent protein structure. So this long chain can fold into um, kind of a coil form um, or a zigzag form. So the coil form is called an alpha helix, and the zigzag is called a beta sheet. And that's just showing you the, the local um, way that the polymer folds. So one single uh, amino acid sequence can have many areas of coils and many areas of, of this um, beta sheet structure. And then they're all linked together with some disordered regions that are called loop regions um, that are just shown as a kind of a string. So in looking at this kind of a figure, what you're looking at is this one long chain folded into a very specific manner of alpha helices and beta sheets connected with loop regions. So this is still one chain in this picture that you can follow through from beginning to end. Um, and the way that this folds is the same every time. Um, and for, a, for the same amino acid sequence. Um, so as I mentioned um, before, when we came to the slide, we know all of these sequences, but we don't know all of these structures. And these structures are really essential for understanding how the protein functions. Um, there are computational methods that are, um, that it's an, an active area of research, and they've been successful um, for some proteins to predict their um, tertiary fold, but we can't do this for, for all proteins yet. So we still need to use um, a, an experiment, X-ray crystallography experiment, to determine the three-dimensional structure of proteins. So um, this is just an, an overview. I have a lot of information on this one slide about how protein structures are solved. Um, and I'm not an expert in this, but, um, but there is one here. So if you have any questions, I can direct you to, to him. Um, so uh, the first step in solving a protein crystal structure is to isolate the protein out of the cell and purify it in, um, in high quantities. So you have to get a very pure sample of the protein. And then crystallographers um, remove the solvent from the protein, so they're basically making this solid crystal state uh, by allowing the solvent to um, evaporate. And so it evaporates into these crystals. And if you could see all of the molecules in the crystal, this is what it would look like. Each individual molecule is a folded protein, and it's arranged in a crystal, so it's a very ordered pattern of the protein molecules. And each protein is folded exactly the same. Um, and then this crystal is placed in front of an X-ray source, and the X-ray beam um, beams through the crystal, and as it goes through, it's diffracted. Oops, sorry. Um, the electrons in the molecule are what are diffracting the X-ray. So the pattern of the, um, of the, diffract the diffracted X-rays are used to determine where the electron densities are in the crystal. So this process of going from this electron density pattern to, um, to this um, three-dimensional map of the electron density in a protein is done um, all by computers now. Um, and it's a Fourier transform um, uh, calculation. And um, I don't know if you can see the electron density in this picture, but there's um, kind of a three-dimensional webbing around each of these atoms in the structure. So crystallographers get this. Uh, that's their raw data from the experiment, uh, these electron densities um, that they can see on their computer screen and rotate around and see in three dimensions. And then they map in the atoms for where the electron densities are. Um, they also have the, 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 the amino acid sequence to work from, too, um, when they're doing this. But they're fitting, um, fitting the atoms to the electron density maps. And from that, um, they um, create a data file that has uh, three-dimensional coordinates for every atom in the protein. And these um, files are, are called um, PDB files, or protein data bank files. And they're, um, I'll show you an example of one on the on the next page. But once you have that PDB file, which many of them are, there's thousands of these files that are publicly available, you can use um, different structure viewing programs that are also freely available to look at the structures. So these are a few of the ones that are, um, that are available online. Um, this is what a protein um, data bank file looks like. It has the XY, so each 
uh, row is one atom in the protein. And then each column here, this x, y, and z, are the three-dimensional coordinates for that atom. So a PDB file, if you were just to look at the text version of it, this is what it, it looks like. It just has the, the data for every, every atom. And then you can open that in different files or different programs. Um, the website for um, storage of uh, these um, files, uh, the, all the PDB files, um, is called the Protein Data Bank. And it's maintained um, at Rutgers. Um, in 1968, there were seven structures in there. And chymotrypsin is one. I just wanted to point that out because we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, and now, the last, I updated, updated this on March 19th. At 5 PM, there were 127,823 structures in the protein data bank. Um, not all of these are human proteins, though. In fact, most of them are not. So this is all of the structures from bacteria and fungus and plants and, um, um, and some human protein structures that are all in this um, database. So um, when you open one of those structures into a structure viewing program, um, what usually comes up first is every atom mapped in the protein. Um, so this is a protein that binds Lipitor, um, HMG-CoA reductase. Um, and this um, enzyme is involved in cholesterol um, synthesis. So when you first open it up, you see all of these atoms. And there are a couple tricks for representing the structure so that it makes it easier to, to look at and to see details and to, to look at the details that you want to be looking at. Um, so one of the first things that you can do is to um, change this into a format that's called the ribbon format or cartoon diagram, which is what I showed on the screen before, which just shows you the, local, the way this long chain is folding into um, to the different local conformations of um, these coils or alpha helices, and then the zigzags are shown with arrows in this program. So you're seeing um, these beta sheets are just places where the chain is folding into a, a zigzag. So then these um, string parts are lo called loops, and they're just um, more disordered um, parts of the structure. And, um, and again, this is one polypeptide chain, uh, one polymer as you follow through. You can follow through all of the ways it <laughs> zigzags around into its globular structure. But it forms this exact structure every time. And it's a very defined um, three-dimensional structure. And the Lipitor binds um, down here in the, in the protein. Um, so then another representation would be looking at the surface of the protein, where you map every atom um, and the space that it takes up in three dimensions. But you map the surface of it. And then um, this is the Lipitor in um, the active site. And this is being shown just as where every, um, every covalent bond is a stick. So you're just looking at the covalent bonds, basically, in Lipitor. And then this is the, um, the active site of the protein is the, is the smooth part around it. So this is showing you the molecular interaction of Lipitor in its active site. Um, and I'll talk more about, uh, about that as, as we go through. Okay. So I'm going to now get back to our story of aspirin. And now that we know more about proteins, we can um, finish, finish up this story and talk about um, Celebrex and Crixidion. Um, so in 1971, so this is after the molecular revolution, and we have um, know about protein and DNA. And um, there were biochemists studying the activities of proteins in cells. And uh, John Bain was the biochemist who uh, discovered that aspirin was inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis. So he was a biochemist studying this pathway and then found that um, aspirin was an inhibitor of this pathway. Um, prostaglandins are a type of molecule that signal, do a lot of different signaling um, work in our bodies. And this is what uh, a general prostaglandin looks like. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what kinds of signaling um, they do. Uh, but he won the Nobel Prize for, for this discovery in 1982. So um, what they found was that aspirin inhibits um, an enzyme involved in synthesizing prostaglandin called cyclooxygenase. And we abbreviate that COX. Um, and it actually um, inhibited two types of, um, of enzymes. And so this is what get, kind of gets back into those side effects that we were talking about. So um, one of the um, enzymes that's inhibit, that it inhibits is called COX-1. And it's a general, uh, it's called kind of a housekeeping 
protein and that it's involved in a, a lot activities that a lot of cells need to do. So a lot of different types of cells will um, express this protein and um, it's used to, to make prostaglandins that synthesize um, in maintaining stomach lining um, along with blood vessel constriction and dilation. Um, and it's, uh, it's present in a lot of tissue types. Um, and COX-2 is a form of the same um, enzyme, so it does, catalyzes the same reaction, but it's a different gene, and so it has a slightly different, um, different uh, DNA structure, slightly different protein, um, but it catalyzes the same reaction. But this gene is inducible, meaning that it's only turned on when it's needed um, or when it's signaled to. And so it's um, made in a response to pain and um, inflammation, signals inflammation. So this would be the um, enzyme that you would want to inhibit in order to inhibit that pain signal. Um, and went, by inhibiting COX-1, that can be part of the problem with um, the stomach irritation. So um, looking at uh, understanding this better, um, the medicinal chemists at uh, drug companies decided that they wanted to try to design a drug that would only inhibit COX-2 and not COX-1, and then that could be um, a better drug than aspirin. Um, so just kind of give you an update on where we are. So um, went all the way from 200 BC with Hippocrates um, to 1970s with um, John Bale discovering prostaglandin, um, aspirin inhibits prostaglandin. And then finally, in 1995, the crystal structure was solved for um, prostaglandin synthase or um, that COX-1 and COX-2. All right, so looking at the crystal structure, um, I'm going to, to show the two structures next to each other in just a minute, but first just to look at COX-1 and um, to show um, this representation again. We're basically looking at one long poly polymer um, folded up and it's going to be the center region, the centered kind of donut area, is where aspirin binds and inhibits the enzyme. So this is also where prostaglandin would bind and um, where the chemical reaction takes place in the enzyme. Um, and, um, and this is a, an, an important amino acid that I'm going to show on the next slide, too. Okay, so on this slide I have um, COX-1, and COX-2 is on the, the right-hand side. These crystal structures are the, the protein sequences are 60% the same. Um, so they don't have very, uh, a lot of different amino acids in them. And as you can see, the, the three-dimensional fold is also very similar, which makes sense since they catalyze the same reaction. Um, but it did make the design process tricky. So if you look at the active site here, um, this kind of donut shape and this donut shape, they only found one amino acid that was different in that region that actually binds the prostaglandins and, um, and aspirin. So on the next slide, I'm going to zoom in on that, that area. So looking at this side, um, the COX-1 active site um, is slightly smaller than COX-2 because of that one amino acid change. So I'm showing that amino acid in the space filling model where you have every atom is... Um, is, is being shown with uh, the full space that it takes up um, instead of being represented in a ribbon form. So I'm kind of showing that one amino acid different than the rest of them. So this one has an extra methyl group, which is a CH3 group um, that sticks out into the active site compared with um, the amino acid over here that doesn't have that. So there's a slightly larger active site for COX-2. So the design strategy was to design a molecule that would be too big to fit in COX-1 because that was the enzyme they didn't want to inhibit since it was maintaining the stomach lining. And they did want to inhibit um, COX-2. So they designed a molecule that was bigger than aspirin that would be specific for COX-2 and not fit into the COX-1 active site. Um, so this, um, looking at this um, crystal structure and trying to design a molecule based on that crystal structure is called um, structure-based drug design. And um, it led to the development of Celebrex. And this is um, the Celebrex um, compound that was um, made by Pfizer. Um, so it's a, a larger structure. You can see compared to aspirin, it has three, um, three large ring structures um, compared with one with aspirin. And this larger structure made it more specific for, um, for COX-2. Um, so this table is kind of an interesting one to look at, just to look at some other drugs in the same category and how they um, rate with selectivity between COX-1 and COX-2. So um, 
these are all in this category. Um, NSAID is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're just all in this, the same category. Um, so aspirin is highly COX-1 selective. So the number over here um, just refers to the, the larger the number means that it's more COX-1 selective. And so this number is interpreted for you here in the selectivity. Um, but seeing the number kind of gives you an idea of the scale of how selective. Um, ibuprofen is less COX-1 selective, so we can see that it still um, prefer, or binds better to COX-1. Um, naproxen, which is Aleve, most of you are more familiar with the, the term Aleve. This one is um, pretty, um, it will inhibit both enzymes about equally, so it's pretty close to one over here in comparison. And then um, Celecoxib, which is the generic name for Celebrex, um, is uh, highly COX-2 selective. So this is being marketed more as an arthritis drug um, and instead of a, um, just a, a general pain reliever. Um, and it um, came with its own set of problems. So this isn't a, a perfect story um, where it is no longer has the, the stomach lining issues, uh, but it, it does have um, other side effects. So that we're not really, wasn't planning to go into too much today, but I did want to get, kind of give that caveat that it's not a, not a perfect drug, um, but, the, but it does, it's a nice, um, kind of example of, of structure-based drug design and how they, they use that um, crystal structure to, to make a different selectivity. Are there any questions on this part before I go on? Yes? One quick question. So that, that active site, um, is it a particular functional group of the Celebrex or the aspirin that's binding to that active site, or is it um, you know, quite a few of the functional groups that are going to set in there and bind to different parts of that active site? Oh, that's a great question. So I should, I don't have a better picture for, for this drug, um, but I, um, I do have a better picture coming up that shows that interaction. So it is, the answer is that it is, it's all of the, that all of the parts of the molecule interact with different parts of the protein. Okay. For aspirin, it actually covalently modifies the active site, which is, is kind of an added step that Celebrex doesn't. Um, but Celebrex, um, the, all, all, all three of these uh, ring structures make contact with the protein, and they're, they're non-covalent um, hydrophobic interactions. Um, and then there's um, hydrogen bonding with the, the sulfate group here and with that amine group with the protein. So it is, it is the full structure that, that's, that interacts. And one other question. Yeah. And I don't know this, but you know how you said a protein always folds the same way? Yes. Is that because of the interactions like hydrogen binding and stuff within the protein that always cause it to play that way? Or Yes. So the more interactions that the protein has um, with, with it in itself, with um, the more stable it is. So there are multiple comfort. There's... Um, there's a folding pathway for different proteins that has been um, just described, and they talk about how the protein can fold in one way, and it's a little bit a local um, dip in energy, but then once it gets to its native fold, which is the, kind of a, what we call a right fold, or whatever, then it has a really low energy. And what gives it that low energy is the fact that it's making so many interactions within itself, um, within, within that polymer as it all folds together, rather than with the solvent. Did you have a, anything to add to that, Craig? <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Is the strength of the particular drug, uh, drug linked to whether it's a COX-1 selective or COX-2 selective? Is the, I'm sorry, I didn't get the first part of your question. The strength of the particular drug. The oh, the strength of it. Um, the strength uh, roughly refers to how, how tight it binds to, to its target drug. So um, the, the tighter that you, you can get that interaction between the drug and the protein, then the less of that drug you have to take. Um, and, and sometimes that also refers, um, will translate into that you don't have to take it as off. Well, I guess that's, there's more. You also have to look at the metabolism of the drug. But in general, when we talk about the strength of it, we're talking about how tight that interaction is with it between the, the drug and the protein. Yes? Uh, is that why they have multiple binding sites for Celebrex? Whereas Aspie's aspirin is covalently bonded. So this thing's got a yeah. pipe bond, just second one go for a while. Um, so there was an added benefit of additional binding sites causing it to not fall off as soon in addition to um, fitting the, bind the uh, regular binding site as well. 
Yes, that's a, a good point too. The more contacts you can make with the protein, the, the tighter that interaction will be between the drug and the, and the protein. Yes, in general, they don't. Um, you don't want to design a drug that's going to covalently bind to the to the protein. That that can lead to more toxicity. So usually, you just want non-covalent interactions. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So um, the next story I was going to talk about is Crixivan, which is a protease inhibitor um, that designed to treat HIV. And in this story, I uh, also am going to bring up some elements of structure-based drug design, um, but uh, it also um, is an interesting story because it, it gives an example about uh, of how uh, previ uh, previous knowledge just from basic science research was really important so that researchers could move quickly when there was a, a new uh, public health um, issue like HIV. Uh, so just to give you a brief background on HIV, um, this virus uh, attacks the CD4 cells in our immune system through, um, it um, contacts the cell, the immune cells through, that specific type of immune cell through this envelope protein. Um, once it gets into that immune cell, it then uses the cell to make copies of itself. Um, and the cell lives for a while making copies, and then, but eventually um, the, it kills the, that immune cell. And it's that decrease in, a, in the immune cell function that is the, um, the makes HIV deadly. Um, the proteins that are in um, the virus that I'm showing here, um, it uses a protein called reverse transcriptase that changes its um, genomic, um, uh, its, uh, its genome is an RNA genome instead of DNA. So reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that changes it back into DNA so that it can incorporate into um, the genome of the immune cell that it affects, and that's what establishes lifelong infection for HIV. Um, and then the protease, I'm going to talk about its action on the next slide. So when, um, when HIV makes its uh, protein um, from the DNA, um, it makes uh, one of the genes codes for this kind of long globular protein here, where you have um, four different um, looks kind of like beads that are connected. Uh, this is non-functional. Um, each one of these different colored beads has a different protein function uh, that won't be, it won't be able to act until protease cleaves it apart. So uh, this happens after the, the uh, new virus has budded off from the immune cell. Then in order to um, complete its um, maturing process, the protease has to cleave these into the individual parts. So if you had a drug that was a protease inhibitor and could inhibit this enzyme and inhibit um, the, the cleavage, then that, then that virus that was just made is non-virulent. So um, it wouldn't be able to infect another cell. Um, okay. So protease was an attractive target for HIV um, because so much was already known about proteases. I mentioned chymotrypsin. Um, that it, that was a protease that was one of the, the first uh, proteins that we had a crystal structure for back in 1968. So um, chymotrypsin was studied for a long time, and we really understood its chemical mechanism and how it, how it worked. And it was one of the first enzymes that we did understand really well. So um, the fact that we understood chymotrypsin really well as a protease helped us <coughs> understand other proteases, even when they had a different structure. Sometimes there were a lot of similarities in the chemistry. Um, so renin was another protease that was already being studied by uh, multiple drug companies at the time um, for blood pressure medication. So by inhibiting this protease, renin, you can lower blood pressure. So there were already drug companies that had a lot of lead compounds for inhibiting renin. Um, and then um, the HIV-1 protease ended up being a really similar protease to renin. So they were able to use all of that research um, and kind of transfer it over to, to HIV um, in order to, uh, to design a, a protease um, inhibitor um, uh, relatively quickly for drug design proce uh, process. Um, so this was the lead compound um, at Merck for, um, for but when they were developing Crixivan. And so this came from their renin um, study. And some of the, the kind of things to, to see in this molecule, um, we had ring structures on both sides. Um, it says that it resembles a peptide, so that it resembles a, a string of amino acids um, a little bit, so there are some elements of that still left. 
Um, and then the center of the molecule, kind of if you, if you were to cut it in half, um, this carbon is bond to, bonded to four different things. So it's called a tetrahedral carbon. And um, that was a really important structural element. Um, and that, was, uh, that came from chymotrypsin. So understanding chymotrypsin helped them know that, um, that to design a good inhibitor, um, that's the kind of, of um, general shape to the molecule you needed. And then um, through the medicinal chemistry process, I'm going to talk about a couple mechanisms. This was their, their final product. Oops. Okay. So one of the techniques in medicinal chemistry is um, called um, quasar or quantitative structure activity relationship, where they take a lead compound and then they just change one part of it to several different um, chemical groups. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, and so in this picture, this R group here, I know this is really small in the back of the room, but this R group can be changed to um, these four different chemical groups. And then they do an assay and determine how well um, that, um, that group does with binding. So if they find something that, that makes the molecule bind a lot better, so it might be making a new contact with the protein that, that wasn't being made before, uh, then they'll um, go, move on to another part of the molecule. They might try to add something over here or change this ring structure using the same kind of process. So just by changing kind of one thing at a time on the molecule to try to make, make something better. So that, that they term um, quasar. And then this ties in really well with structure-based drug design. Um, and this is the picture that's a little bit nicer that I didn't have for, for um, Celebrex. Um, in this picture, we're looking at the surface of the protein. Um, and it's also being mapped with its charges. So the white color means that it's an uncharged region of the protein, so mostly carbons. Um, the blue color means it's positive, and the red color means it's negative. So there's more oxygens in the negative part, um, nitrogens in the blue part. And then this, um, this stick diagram here, this is a, um, a peptide binding in the active site. So um, with the drug, you would have um, the blue part or positive parts line up with the negative parts on the protein so that you would get that um, charge interaction, that attraction, like a, it's almost like a magnet coming together. Um, so you look for, as a chemist, looking at this structure, you would look for ways to, um, to maximize those interactions. So in looking at a structure of a lead compound, um, you could uh, look at, try to figure out ways that you could make that better by maybe taking into an account a, a particular pocket um, that hadn't been used by the drug that existed in the protein. So you might be able to see this in three-dimensional shape and by ro rotating it around, see, oh, there's a little crevice here that I could um, stick a, an amine and then that would interact with a negative charge on the protein and that might make a new interaction to make a tighter binding drug. Um, so the chemists can get ideas from studying um, the structure and work with the biochemists um, together to, to come up with new ideas and, and new, um, new things to add to the, to the molecule. Um, so they, they look for both um, um, complementarity with the charge interactions and then also the shape. So sometimes you can, um, you can improve the, the shape in order to get the, the drug to fit better too. So this was their final product, um, indinavir, which is the generic name for crixivan. Um, so it has this, this center carbon, and then it's fairly um, symmetrical on either side when you look at the, the ring structures and, and the, the size of the molecule. And then um, the next picture, you can see it in the binding site. Um, the HIV protease is actually a dimer, meaning it has two copies of the same protein that function together as a unit. So this yellow part is exactly the same as this blue part, um, and they work together as a protease. And the inhibitor binds right in the middle between the two, um, very um, symmetrically. Um, and so this was a, a, um, a, a nice um, success story for structure-based drug design. Um, are there any questions on that part before I go on? Yes. How does the drug ever release from the protein? Um, that, that's a, a really good question. So what, what we show with these pictures is not really getting at the actual di molecular dynamics that are going on. And this, uh, this binding is not, um, there's always an off rate for every drug protein interaction. So it's always coming on and off in, in some amount. And so the pro there's always some movement there. Um, and then 
the tighter binding it is, then the, the, the less frequently it comes off, goes off. But every time it goes off, it has a chance of diffusing away. So, um, so eventually, um, uh, drugs that we take, uh, they diffuse off and they get metabolized and, and out of our system. So that this is always an, an on-off process. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, all right, so what I've talked about with the structure-based drug design and quasar is part of medicinal chemistry called pharmacodynamics, which is um, the study of how the ligand interacts with its binding site and trying to optimize that interaction. So for a new drug study, usually they start with a lead compound, which is something that they already know binds to the protein, but then they're trying to make it better. So, um, and then they, they can use those, those strategies, and that's the, that process of pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics has to happen at the same time, um, and it uh, will study how um, that drug is going to reach its target, um, and what happens along the way, how it's metabolized, how it's excreted, toxicity, um, all goes into the, the pharmacokinetics part of the study. And 40% um, of drugs fail because of pharmacokinetic studies, so they don't want to go too far along down the road um, with, a, with a drug bef um, when, when, this, when this half isn't working. So um, they are always thinking um, also about this, this property in drug design. So I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but just um, to, another, to give you a couple idea of a couple tricks that um, also um, our uh, medicinal chemists use. Um, the, in this um, pharmacokinetic strategy, um, they can um, be abbreviated ADME for the different steps in this process. So for absorption, um, the, the goal is um, for every, I would say most new drug projects are to make a drug that's orally bioavailable. So we know that doesn't always work. There are some things that are only available intravenously um, that we can't always get it in a pill form. Um, but the goal is to get it into a pill form. And so in order for that to happen, the drug has to be um, water-soluble enough to dissolve in, in the stomach and in the intestines, um, and then lipid-soluble enough in order to pass through a membrane. So there's always this balance between the two. So if we look at drugs that are orally bioavailable, this is um, ampicillin, um, which is a really a common antibiotic that probably most of us have taken, um, that it satisfies um, these um, four properties. Um, which is called Lipinski's rule of five, um, which even though there's only four rules, but every rule has a five um, or a factor of five in it, I guess. So it's, it's, um, it's short term is to, to call it Lipinski's rule of five. Um, so the, what this study did was they looked at all the drugs that were bi orally bioavailable and tried to figure out what were the commonalities so that they could um, kind of try to apply these to new drugs and eliminate the ones that were less likely to be orally bioavailable. So they found that drugs that were available um, in pill form usually um, did not have a molecular weight that went over 500 Daltons. Um, they had a nice balance of hydrogen bonding um, groups um, and hydrophobic groups. Um, and the, the log P is something that is measured in order to determine um, basically how lipid soluble versus water soluble a compound is, so whether or not it dissolves in oil or water. Um, and so they, they can measure that. Um, distribution, um, and that's called the log P. So they have this set of rules that they can apply to drugs even before it goes into any kind of testing or assays. So this can all just be done in a computer um, based on the, the chemical structure. So that's what makes that useful, even though it's not 100% accurate. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit um, at the end of my talk here about um, some, some ideas that are about um, finding new drug targets and new drug molecules. So there's kind of two um, basic strategies. The first one um, that I talked about, um, finding a lead compound um, that, you, um, that has the effect you want. So this would be more like with aspirin. You, we already um, knew that aspirin worked. Um, so the natural products that you already know kind of that they have an effect would be um, starting with a compound that has the effect and then trying to identify its target. Um, or you can um, start with a protein that you want to inhibit. So this would be like the Crixivan project where, you, um, where we already knew that we wanted to inhibit HIV protease in order to inhibit the, inhibit the virus. So projects can start either way. Um, so finding a new lead compound 
Natural products has historically been our source for new interesting molecules that had uh, medicinal effects. Um, and we could find out about those just through um, folk and herbal remedies, um, ethnobotany. Um, but this is becoming um, less common for, for drug companies to look towards um, natural products, partly because they can, um, it's, been, it's been tricky to um, be able to replicate um, uh, an effect that you might see um, in a plant um, with, a, that, with an isolated natural product. Because sometimes there are synergistic effects within the plant or the, or the herbal supplement. Uh, that it can be hard to replicate um, by isolating individual compounds and trying to get that same effect. Um, but the National Cancer Institute is, is one of the, the main institutes that is still going out and collecting new samples and isolating new active compounds and, and maintaining a database of those. Um, so, but most um, drug companies have, have slowed that process, that part of their research. And that's partly because they already have such a large library of compounds to start with for, um, to find lead compounds. So over the years, they save. Um, so the natural products are part of those databases. Um, and over the years, they've saved all the molecules that they've made for other products um, in their um, libraries. So they have um, pretty big libraries to start from um, in order to find a, a lead compound. And then combinatorial chemistry um, came in on also um, I'm going to describe that on this next slide, but it also ended up kind of replacing some of those natural product um, programs. Um, okay, so for combinatorial chemistry, um, this was a technique that was um, really um, used a, a lot starting in the 90s, where um, chemists could make a, a huge number of compounds um, with different chemical properties very quickly. So they attached a molecule to a bead, um, so these circles are the beads. And then they um, exposed that, or they ran different chemical reactions with those compounds and modified those structures in different ways. Um, and then you could mix these tubes of beads into different reactions and form um, a variety of different compounds. So this technique allowed chemists to make a lot of, a lot of different compounds quickly. So um, that helped them find um, new lead compounds um, and expand their libraries using this technique. Um, another technique for finding lead compounds, um, the computers are used a lot now for, uh, for matching or for modeling compounds to protein, so to a protein target. So in this picture, it's just kind of just showing the basic process for, for doing this kind of matching process. So you could start with a three-dimensional um, protein structure um, just um, uh, show in, your, in the computer, and then um, Run, the computer can run through small molecule databases. So this is, these are some publicly available databases of small molecules, and they also have the 3D structure of those. And then the computer program can match them together and see what fits and give it a fit score. Um, the ones that, are, that are, um, fit well based on the parameters of the program, um, you can then analyze for their Lipinski rule of five and see if they're likely to be orally bioavailable. Um, and then you can get a set of lead compounds using that method and then um, move into biological screens. So a lot of this can be um, automated um, using these um, computer modeling programs. Um, it's also interesting, I think, to look at the, look at the section of, of like, human drug targets. So this study um, was done using um, all of the drugs in the drug bank database, which is a really um, nicely annotated database that's available publicly. Um, it's just uh, drugbank.ca, so it's a Canadian website. And they, um, uh, this website keeps, uh, cor correlates both the molecular information with the protein information. Um, and you can access, um, it will link to other biochemical databases that have the PDB structures for proteins. And you can um, really look up a lot with, uh, to find out the molecular basis of drug action for any drug that you might be interested in. So I have a cu couple computers up here if you wanted to um, play around with, um, with some of this at the end of this talk. Um, but I wanted to tell you about this study. Um, using all of the drugs that were in the drug um, database, they um, eliminated any that were, did not have protein um, or human protein targets and found that um, there were um, 989 unique drugs um, that, and they would target only 435 different protein targets. And this is just human, human protein targets. 
So it's estimated that we have 19,000 protein encoding genes in the human genome, um, and only 435 of those currently have medications designed um, for, for them. I mean, not every protein is going to be a good drug target, but it is interesting, I think, to look at what the, what the maximum is and, and how, how close we are to that. So um, there, there are other, other targets to explore. Um, so just kind of the, the take-home messages from my talk tonight. Um, so um, most, I did, didn't really mention this at the beginning, but about 90% of the drugs on the market are small molecule drugs that target a protein. So um, that's, that's what everything in my talk was tonight, but there are some other categories of drugs coming out that are, um, there's drugs that are small proteins um, and drugs that target DNA. So there, so there are some different examples out there, but most of them are small molecules that target proteins. Um, and then I talked about um, some of the, the basic science research and how important that can be um, funded by the NIH to make sure that we're ready when a new public health challenge comes out. So we saw that with Crixivan. Um, and then there's some public databases. There's a lot of information that's available um, through um, the NIH website and also um, this drug bank website that I mentioned. I'll talk about that in just a second. So I have these on my last um, reference slide here. <clears throat> There's, this is a, another nice database to go to if you're interested in learning about a particular drug um, or medicine. And then um, these are the textbook figures that I used here. And um, so then my references for the, the story of aspirin, if you're interested, there's some more details in those. Um, so this was just kind of my, my general process. If you're interested, um, afterwards, I have these um, computers set up here. If you um, in order to um, find out the mechanism of action of a protein you're interested in, I would start out at that drug bank website and then scroll down to the section where they have mechanism of action. So it's going to be different for different medicines. Some of them, they don't have the protein target um, crystallized. Um, but if they did, you could um, then go and get the, the PDB file for that. And um, PyMole is a free program, so you could load that on your computer, whether it's PC or Mac. And, um, and generate a picture of, your, of the, the active site and the, the drug interaction. So maybe you'll get some ideas for how you could design your, your medicine better by looking at that. So I just want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any more questions. <laughs>